located in two places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to back into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performance. Yeah, as Ben said, uh, my name is Jorik. I work for GitLab. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction into garbage collection. It's a, uh, a fairly complex topic, so I hope I kind of can manage everything in uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, if you're familiar with it, I had to skip over some like the, the details because otherwise everybody's mind just explodes. Before we continue, there's some... Uh, oh, it's kind of... yeah, whatever. It, good enough. There's some... Uh, mandatory company propaganda. I work for GitLab. Uh, ben said I do performance. I have a ton of propaganda in my bag in the form of stickers, t-shirts, uh, I even have slap bracelets. I only have two, so they're uh, first come first serve. Don't steal them. <laughs> um, we're hiring, of course. Um, next, the topic of garbage collection is difficult, as I said. There's a book called the Garbage Collection Handbook. It's about $100, which is pretty expensive for a book, but it explains basically everything there is to know about garbage collection up until um, 2011. And it is an absolute must. Like the Google has a lot of information, but as I've experienced myself, a, a lot of the information is targeting the JVM. So you try to Google for a specific algorithm and there's like 500 Stack Overflow pages of questions how the JVM does that, which may be useful if that's what you're looking for. But if you want to see like, okay, how does this actually work? Um, you're best off buying this book. Now, uh, memory management is a part of a uh, garbage collection is a part of memory management. Um, every program needs memory. Without it, it can't really do much. <laughs> And traditionally, there's sort of three ways of doing it. You can manage it manually, as is done in C, C++, um, Rust, uh, etc. Which basically comes down to there's a function which you call, you tell it how much memory you want, you get that in return, or it fails, uh, and depending on the result, you can do whatever you want with it. And once you're done, you have to explicitly release that back to the operating system or terminate the program when that happens automatically. Um, the second one is reference counting. Um, examples that use it are Python, PHP, um, Erlang uses it to a certain extent for certain types of data. Uh, what it essentially comes down to is that the memory you use is sort of wrapped in an extra structure where there's a counter, and every time you refer to it, that counter gets increased, and every time the, um, the pointer goes out of scope, it gets decreased, and once it reaches zero, the memory is released. The third one, which is the one we'll be talking about today, is called tracing garbage collection. Uh, examples are Java, Ruby, Go, D, uh, basically almost any interpretive programming language uses it to a certain extent. Um, it's by far, next to manual memory management, by far the most popular technique. Now, the way tracing garbage collection works is that at some point the choice is made that your memory needs to be uh, examined so that we can clean up and uh, reuse it later on. The way this works in a garbage collector is that um, at some point the program decides this is necessary and it will sort of find the objects that it can immediately see, so local variables that are on the stack for example. And then through those it will sort of traverse all the objects that it can reach and as it finds those, they are sort of considered as to be live, so they have to stay around. And it can do extra stuff with it, um, which we'll go in later. And so in other words, the um, life, life neatness, if I pronounce it correctly, of memory is determined by being reachable through a graph. It was originally invented in 1959 by a guy called John McCarthy. Um, also known for inventing Lisp, in particular parenthesis, um, he did a lot of AI development um, and a whole lot more. Um, he invented the first algorithm, but it wasn't the only one. There's many variations since. Uh, worth noting, the one he invented is still the most popular one today. 
In some terms, uh, one of the reasons garbage collection is difficult is because there are a lot of terms that if you're not familiar with them, it just it's kind of confusing what people are talking about. Um, and they're not really properly explained always on the internet. You might find some page where they explain something, um, but it, it kind of differs. So some of the terms that are the most important, the percentage mutator, which is simply a thread that runs your code. Um, if you have a language like Go, for example, where there are lightweight processes, those are your mutators instead. Uh, thread here shouldn't really be taken as a uh, operating system thread, but a piece of code running essentially. The collector is a thread that performs garbage collection. Fairly simple. We have the roots, which are uh, best explained as the roots of a tree, like the um, the tree plant, uh, not a uh, not the structure. And these are objects that are immediately reachable. So when the process determines that garbage collection is necessary, it will look at the call stack and whatever is available on the stack directly and global variables and that sort of thing, those are the roots. Um, there's a two sort of terms that are related, precise and conservative. That basically means how accurate a garbage collector is. If it's precise, it knows where everything is and it can do whatever it wants. If it's conservative, it doesn't know that by default. And so typically you need to um, give it some help so that it can find pointers. Uh, a quick example, if you have say uh, Ruby C extensions, they can allocate memory uh, in their uh, C code. And because those pointers can be everywhere, the garbage collector by default doesn't know they exist in the first place. So when you write C extensions, you can have these sort of hooks that are executed when garbage collection runs. Then you can use to say like, hey, I have a pointer here, make sure that it doesn't get destroyed. There's a write barrier, which is, um, it's, I found personally the most confusing term because I thought of it as like an actual barrier a process where code sort of stops and then waits for other things. It is simply code that runs whenever you write. It's uh, The term itself is vague, but the definition is fairly simple. So when you, for example, store a value in an array, you could, for example, trigger a write barrier that does something extra, whatever that may be. The last term, probably the one most people are familiar with, is stop the world. Uh, this essentially means that a garbage collector will simply pause the entire application, do its thing, and then resume it. Garbage collection is essentially four, usually maybe five steps. It's, as I mentioned, you determine the roots. This you do by scanning the call stack, um, looking at global variables, whatever you can immediately find. Then you traverse through the graph that um, is produced by these objects. You record in some way which objects you want to keep around and then you essentially reclaim everything that was not reached. And then optional, you may decide to compact memory so that it's reused more efficiently. So we've mentioned that garbage collectors typically do not release memory back to the operating system, which is for example why if in Ruby you uh, read a really large file into memory, that memory is not gonna be released. Instead, it will be reused at some point. The first algorithm, which is the uh, original one invented in 1959, is called mark and sweep. Um, it's, for example, used by Ruby's garbage collector. It's probably one of the most popular and most researched algorithms out there. Uh, the original one invented in 1959 was, is often referred to as a naive mark and sweep because um, it operators stopped the world and there was no optimization whatsoever. Um, but it being 1959, this being the first algorithm at the time, this was revolutionary. Uh, mark and sweep is broken up into two phases. Um, the name is not as creative as the algorithm. The first phase is called the mark phase, which is where we traverse the graph and we mark objects as being live. There were, there's two ways you can do this. There's one um, where every object has a flag, uh, typically a Boolean, that when you mark it, you set that to true. And that indicates that the, uh, the object has been marked. The second approach is a technique called bitmap marking. This is a technique that Ruby's Garbage Collector recently adopted. Um, they, they sort of boasted about how better things got, but it's a technique that, as far as I could find, dates back to 1989. It's not as revolutionary. Um, the, the best way to describe it is that you have a bitmap structure, which is essentially an array, and every 
object has an index in that array. And when you mark it, instead of writing a flag directly to an object, you figure out what the index is and then you set that one to true. So you end up with, for example, some indexes that are unset and some that are set. The reason for these two techniques is that while marking um, objects directly is fairly easy, it is problematic because when you write to an object you may flush caches, uh, CPU caches for example, uh, and in case of Ruby where if you fork it will use copy on write so the memory of the parent process is uh, shared with the child process until a write happens and when it happens it will copy the memory and then write to it. What this means is if you store the flags in the objects directly if a garbage collection cycle runs in the child process it will copy all the memory of all the objects that it has marked. So this means that you will now suddenly have uh, a lot more memory being used simply because you ran a garbage collection which is a little bit counterintuitive because the goal is to uh, reuse memory more efficiently and not suddenly allocate more of it. Downside of um, bitmap marking is that it's a little bit more complex because you have to figure out how to go from a object to the index and you may have a single bitmap or you may have multiple divided into chunks of whatever so that whole process of finding what do I have to set and where is it uh, is a bit complex but it doesn't suffer from the copy on write problems and the caching problems. So most um, more modern garbage collectors typically use bitmaps. Um, if, if you don't use copy and write it's not necessarily needed um, but if you do then it's basically an absolute must. Now the second part of mark and sweep is called the sweep phase and this is where essentially two things happens. The uh, garbage collector has determined which objects are alive by marking them either using flags or bitmaps and then it needs to reclaim memory so that later on uh, that memory can be used for new objects. The way mark and sweep does is it will essentially traverse all memory in the heap just one by one and I'll check is this thing marked okay then we have to uh, reset the mark uh, flag so that the next run we uh, don't keep the memory around and then it may do something extra as keeping track of statistics or whatever it needs to determine what memory it can uh, reclaim. So um, step one we traverse, we check if it's marked, we reclaim the memory if it's not marked and we just continue doing that until we're done. The performance, char the performance characteristics here is that in the mark phase the time is dominated by how many objects are alive. So if you have say only 10 objects it's going to complete fairly quickly. However, if you have, say, a million, um, it, it may take quite a while. For example, um, GitLab's Rails application, when you boot a Rails console, it has about 900,000 objects that are live. Um, e even if it would take, like, maybe a couple of microseconds per object or nanoseconds or whatever, um, traversing that is going to take quite some time. Sweeping, on the other hand, is largely dominated by uh, how much memory you want to reclaim, how many things you need to reset. Some garbage collectors can do this in parallel, so it won't actually uh, affect your applications, but some others do not. Mark and Sweep suffers from a fragmentation problem. Um, the reason is when we mark objects as live and we leave um, and we have to determine what is not live, it's possible that our heap has holes in it. So there may be a used object at the start, a couple of holes where we could fit objects, but the memory is not used and then more objects that are used. Now typically in a um, garbage collected language memory is allocated at the end of the heap. So the way that works is some kind of pointer that points to the memory and every time you allocate you sort of increase that pointer to the next position. That way when you allocate objects, uh, which is a process that happens very often, the time spent doing so is as minimal as possible. There's no complex logic you have to see, have to use to figure out where to allocate um, and so on. But this means that if you don't deal with those holes you'll keep using more and more memory when in reality you could potentially fit all those objects uh, at the start. Now there's different techniques for it um, generally they are referred to as compacting. Essentially what it comes down to is you either sort of move all objects to the left as if you have like a messy desk and you just kind of like shove everything to the left there's also other techniques where 
objects are specifically rearranged and then chunks may be moved around. It depends a bit on how you store heap. But ultimately the goal is that uh, when you allocate you can reuse memory without having to put extra work on the allocator because it runs much more often than a garbage collection cycle. Uh, if you want to compact the heap, that, me needs that, that means that the garbage collect has to be precise. It has to know where all the pointers are, because if it compacts objects, uh, compacts the heap and thus moves memory around, it has to update the pointers. If it doesn't do that, your program may crash because it's using memory that's no longer valid, or it may be using a pointer that points to a new object that, was, um, that overrode the memory. And those problems are very hard to debug. Like for example, I, um, I'm working on my own garbage collector for a programming language, and I spend about three weeks debugging such a problem. Um, because you often, you get some bizarre error where it says like, oh, I cannot find this instance variable. And you look at the memory and it looks like everything's okay, except that thing you're looking up is not there. This is because many cycles earlier, that memory was overridden, for example. The second algorithm, which is basically the second most popular one, is called the semispace collector, sometimes also called the copying semispace collector. What it essentially does is, instead of having a single heap, it has two. And these are typically referred to as from and to, which are probably the most confusing names because they're eventually swapped around. Which is, I personally wouldn't know of a better name, but it's kind of like, the way the algorithm works is that you have your from and to space, which are equal size, and the way you mark is you copy objects from the from space to the to space. And so you, you copy them, you end up with um, uh, the, the memory essentially existing in two places. Now to reclaim memory, what we essentially do is we sort of forget about the memory that is in a from space. Um, if, if your garbage collector runs in debugging mode, it might overwrite them with zeros, for example, but typically it's, it's just forgotten that it's even there. And we then sort of swap the uh, uh, from and to spaces so that now the from space contains the objects that we are still using, and the to space can now be used for the same process the next cycle. Uh, downside is that it's fairly memory inefficient, like you need twice the memory in the worst case. Um, the benefit is that it's typically, uh, it can be very fast, because you don't have to explicitly mark objects, um, and you don't, and, and reclaiming memory is simply overriding what was left. Uh, fragmentation is dealt with automatically, because objects are copied, there's no need to explicitly compact things together. Uh, and it requires that the collector is precise. Again, if we were to move memory around and there was some pointer somewhere in C code that's not updated, then all hell could break loose. Uh, a third algorithm, this is a fairly um, new one. It was originally developed at the end of 2007. It's not really widely used, um, in part, I think, because of the, there's just no advertising going on behind it. Um, also, it's a fairly new one. It's uh, a mark region collector, in particular, an implementation called IMIX. Um, there's a technical paper, a fair warning, the paper is pretty complex to read. I've read it, I think, uh, probably a hundred times, and I ended up emailing with the authors of the paper because I still had some questions. The, the way it essentially works is that um, there's a single heap, similar to mark and sweep, except the heap is divided into chunks called blocks. They are uh, 32 kilobytes of memory that's aligned, and those blocks in turn are divided into uh, 128 bytes of aligned memory. Now the allocator, the way it works is it will allocate into any free blocks that it has. If it doesn't have those, it will try to uh, request new blocks from a global pool. And when doing all of that, it will skip any lines that are used. The garbage collector in turn, when it uh, marks objects, which it does similarly to mark and sweep, it will mark both objects and lines so that the allocator knows which lines to skip. Uh, furthermore, if there are any blocks that are completely free, they are returned to the global pool so that some other threads can use them, for example. 
and blocks that still have some life objects are marked as being uh, recyclable so that the next allocation cycle will allocate into these blocks before requesting new ones. Uh, once collection is done, the collector goes on about its business. Uh, fragmentation is something that can happen here as well because it moves things around um, and because you may have certain blocks where there's a hole somewhere at the start while you're allocating at the end. Uh, what Amix does there is it um, uses opportunistic evacuation which is really just a fancy way of saying we'll sometimes move objects around. Um, they use statistics for that uh, based on previous cycles so they try to determine how many um, how many use lines there are, how many things we can potentially move around. But because it's all based on statistics from a previous cycle, it's possible that it determines that we need to move things around, but it runs out of space. This is where the opportunistic part comes in. If that happens, it just stops. Um, a sort of refinement of garbage collection is the um, process of thing, whatever you would call it, called generational collection. The idea is that a, um, an object typically only sticks around for a fairly short period of time. If you look at, for example, your average Rails application, most objects, they stick around for a request cycle. So a, a model instance that you get from the database, whatever you need to render your views, etc. You get that data, you use it, and then you're basically done with it. There are very few things that stick around for a long time. And so the theory is that if you break those objects up essentially by age, you can reduce the workload. If you don't do that and you have, say, um, 900,000 objects, you would have to go over all those objects every single time. Whereas if you break that up, it's possible that the, um, the number of objects you have to process most of the time is much smaller, and thus the time spent is smaller. The way that works is the heap is essentially divided into two generations, called young and mature. Um, some old Smalltalk implementations several decades ago, they used multiple generations, uh, but it was sort of experienced that this didn't really work, because the uh, complexity with every generation essentially increases. So nowadays it's only two. Uh, the young generation is objects that are new, they typically only stay in this generation for a few garbage collection cycles. Um, then we have the Eden space, which is sort of a subsection. Um, some collectors specifically call it, some call it the nursery or different terms, but it's essentially a small region where objects are allocated by default. So you create a new string, it goes into the Eden space. And then as it gets older, it gets to the, um, the extra spaces of the young generation and then Eventually, it's promoted to the mature generation. These are objects that have survived either several garbage collection cycles or many, many, many. Uh, they can also contain objects that simply continue to exist forever. Um, think, for example, a array that stuck around for a while and was then assigned to a global variable, for example. Now, the way collection here works is that uh, when you allocate objects, at some point garbage collection is triggered and this will look, do we need to only collect the young generation or do we also need to collect the mature generation? Uh, Ruby, for example, introduced this in, I think it was Ruby 2.1. Um, yeah, okay, so 2.1, they institu bleh, introduced generational garbage collection. They called it Rgen C, if I remember correctly. Um, and it, it, it does that. So your objects are allocated into young and at some point they're promoted. And ultimately the idea is to reduce garbage collection timings, and in the case of Ruby also the pulse timings, which means that your application isn't just stopped for milliseconds on an end. So young collection only collects young objects, and a mature collection collects both. Generally the idea is that the, the older the generation, when you collect those, you collect everything that precedes it. Uh, one problem in this setup is that if you collect a young um, generation, because you do not traverse anything from the uh, mature space, it's possible that if you store a young object in a mature object, you would lose track of that. So for example, you have a global array um, and you push, say, a string into that. If that global array is in the mature space and you would only 
uh, garbage collect the young generation and there's no reference to that thing on the stack or whatsoever the garbage collector may think like oh hey that thing is gone so we can release it when in reality it's still in that array so the way that works is that when such a write happens you have to track it um, this some different techniques in terms of what you track and so on but it's typically stored in a remembered set which is as the name implies a set containing the pointers and the set is updated using a write pair which is again simply a piece of code that runs um, how you imagine this it's basically the write pair simply says like oh hey if the for example the source pointer is a young pointer and the pointer of the object we're writing to is mature then we insert uh, either of the two into the remembered set. Now there's two things you can store. You can store the pointer that you're writing or the object or, or pointer to the object that you're writing to. Um, this benefits and drawbacks to both. If you store only the pointers that you're writing, the uh, potentially the objects you have to scan is smaller. If that object is simply a string, it doesn't have any child pointers, so you only need to scan one thing and you're done. The downside is, is that if you write multiple of these pointers through the same object, you'd have to scan every single one of those. So the opposite of that is to store the pointer of the object that you're writing to. That way, if there are multiple writes, it's only one thing you need to scan. The downside is that the object may have a lot of other pointers, so the, the workload can increase. Um, there's no real silver bullet. Um, I don't really know what popular garbage collectors use, I couldn't really find it. But it, it basically comes down to what you think is best for your case and maybe what people have measured. So they might have used one approach and then said like, oh, for our case it works better if we do the opposite. Uh, the way that works is when the... Um, when we traverse the object graph, we take the roots and we essentially append whatever is in the remembered set to it, and then we process it as usual. Uh, another improvement, which is also what uh, Ruby does, is called incremental garbage collection, or a incremental two minutes? All right. Um, which basically means that the garbage collector happens in steps, just does a little bit of work, pauses, etc. A parallel collector can uh, perform the work in parallel. It's a bit confusing because it doesn't necessarily mean that your code can continue running. It means that there are multiple threads performing garbage collection work. As a concurrent collector, which does run while your application is running, um, the problem here is that it has to track any writes that happen um, in your application while it is running. Otherwise, again, it could lose those. Um, a technique for that is called tricolor marking. Uh, each object essentially has a color, uh, white, gray, or black. Worth mentioning that this isn't typically implemented specifically, so there's not a field that says color is white, but it's sort of more a an abstraction that you uh, would write down on paper or, or think about. And essentially, white objects are objects that are unreachable, so they are ready to be reclaimed. Gray objects are uh, reachable from the roots, but have not been scanned. And black objects are objects that are reachable and have been fully scanned. And they cannot contain white objects. Now what happens is a, um, a mutator may write to a black object, for example. So we scanned it, but our program is still running and it will write something to it. The way we attract that is again using a write barrier, which can do different things. Um, there's about six different techniques. They, um, they, they were invented over the years, starting in the 60s. And they all do sort of slightly different things, but it comes down to that um, the colors are essentially reset so that the collector will uh, retry until it determines it's done. Um, it's too much to cover in the presentation, especially since I only have two minutes remaining. Um, the, the garbage collection handbook I mentioned earlier, it lists all these uh, techniques with pseudocode and everything. It's probably the, the best resource for it. Uh, finally, a very quick look at what Ruby does, I mentioned it along the lines. Um, it's generational, apparently I knew it since 2.1. It's conservative, um, you can store pointers in C code, so by default it cannot find those. Um, so you have to provide these hook functions that run whenever garbage collection occurs. 
it uses bitmaps for marking. I think those were introduced also in 2.1 or 2.2, somewhere along the lines. Um, it stopped the world, so it pulses all your threads when it runs. It's incremental with the goal that those pulse timings take less time. And it does not compact explicitly. Instead, it has this technique, which I couldn't really find how exactly it works. Uh, but they try to reuse memory uh, whenever they allocate objects. And that's it.